Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, fantastic. Well, I'm so glad that everyone's here today um, virtually. It's exciting to see so many folks interested in these important questions and issues of instruction. I'm um, particularly happy to see a number of folks from here in New York joining me, um, joining us here today. Um, so I actually started my career as a middle school teacher. I taught uh, English language learners at a middle school in California. And in my time as a teacher, I often thought that while I had some good tools and some things that I thought were working, I never felt that I quite had um, the support and the strong principles for instruction that I needed. And so one thing I'm actually particularly proud of with this research guide, uh, with this practice guide, is that I think it provides teachers not only with um, some good, solid research-based principles for their instruction, but that it explains and illustrates those principles through some really well-designed and thoughtful examples. Um, you'll hear a bit about that today um, from Joan and Joe, but I also encourage you to read the practice guide and to look at it because I think it's the kind of document that can be a nice basis for rich instructional conversations with your colleagues at your school site. Um, not only about the sort of big ideas in the guide, but also about how to put those ideas into place, into practice. So uh, the first thing I just want to do is acknowledge that this practice guide is a the, uh, sort of a labor of love over several years um, by, a, by a team of folks. So we had six researchers um, based in universities, um, two active, uh, active uh, educators based in school districts, and then the support from the Instructional Research Group team. I also want to acknowledge Noni Lasso, who was one of, a member of the Practice Guide panel and who also um, contributed a great deal to these slides I'm, talk, I'm using today. So when we think about English learners, we need to think about a variety of ways in which there are opportunity gaps uh, and a number of systemic and big scale kinds of challenges that they face in a variety of ways. So when we think about English learners and think about linguistic diversity, we're thinking about the degree to which uh, English learners enter school with um, underdeveloped English skills to at least as assessed by assessments, and that sometimes they may have underdeveloped skills in their primary language as well. We also know that students who learn two languages and become bilingual have cognitive advantages in a number of ways that we can leverage in instruction, in particular that they have heightened metalinguistic awareness, awareness of the nature of language um, and abilities, strategic abilities to manipulate that. We also know that English language learners as a group um, are often, uh, many of them are growing up in poverty and have the variety of challenges associated with that, including all sorts of acute and chronic stressors, emotional and social challenges that come with um, under-resourced communities in some ways, or communities that have less financial resources, and that they often face language environments that are mismatched to the language of school, that the environments they face in schools are mismatched in a variety of ways to the environments that they may have grown up in. Um, and all of this uh, is also contextualized in the fact that many English learners are attend schools that are under-resourced and segregated often from native English speakers and middle-class students. As a result, we know that English learners often have limited opportunities to develop more advanced literacy skills, that they have high rates of special education placement, that they have high dropout rates. All of this, I think, is just context for thinking about um, how, as educators, we can best equip our English learner students and our students from all sorts of linguistically and culturally diverse backgrounds to meet and to fulfill their potential. I'm going to say a couple of things um, as background about English literacy development of English learners. Um, and for many of you, this may just be a reminder of things you already know, but I think it's important context before I jump into the recommendations. So if we ask this question of what is reading, and this is, seems like a simple question, but it actually ends up being quite complicated, and researchers have studied it for quite a while. If you think about a typical passage, this is sort of a fifth grade passage about high-speed trains, we know that there are a variety of skills that play into reading. There are what we would consider more lower order skills, the basic skills of sounding out words, knowing that the word speed has five letters and is one word, but actually is broken up into four different sounds. That a word like high, ha, in order to pronounce this word, you need to see its relationship to other words like sigh and thigh. And that these skills, these sort of lower order uh, reading skills, 
must not just be, students might not just become accurate at these, but they may need to become fluent and efficient so that by fifth grade or so they can read 115 words correct per minute, for instance. Of course, this is not reading. This is just part of reading because, of course, there's a whole variety of high order skills that also come into play. So we know that students need to um, involve rich cognitive strategies to think actively while reading, that students need to be interested and motivated readers, that they need a more complex understanding of language, including vocabulary, relevant background knowledge, and understanding not just the meanings of words, but how those change and are adapted in different contexts. So the example here is the word service, which may not be that challenging to sound out, but to understand which meaning it has in this sentence or in this paragraph is quite complicated. Uh, just as this one example, the word service has 14 different definitions or 14 different meanings. So figuring out which is the correct meaning, which is the appropriate meaning, having a deep understanding of the meanings of the word service is, uh, uh, is required for reading in a more sophisticated or, or complex way. One way to think about this is that there are two different problem spaces that play into literacy. So one being those lower ordered skills or code based, meaning, code based skills in terms of thinking about concepts about print, the ability to manipulate spoken words, word reading, spelling, and then fluency. And that the other problem space, which is more complicated and larger in many ways, involves knowledge and meaning. So understanding concepts about the world, the ability to understand and express complex ideas, uh, sophisticated academic vocabulary, and oral language skills. And that both of these problem spaces contribute to what we understand as literacy in terms of reading and writing skills, as well as the listening and speaking skills that support them. This distinction, I think, is important for thinking about English learners because we know from research that English learners may struggle with the skills around code, the code and sounding out words fluently and accurately, and that some of them may struggle, but they don't struggle any more than monolinguals do. So a lot of research suggests that this problem space can be a challenge for English learners, but it's not a particular challenge any more than it is for, for many uh, monolingual speakers. On the other hand, the problem space involved with more high order language skills and meaning based skills, many English language learners do struggle with this problem space when they're working in English. We know from, a, from quite a bit of research. The other piece to keep in mind is that for English learners, they are facing increased text demands, not only as they move up through the grades, but also with new initiatives like the Common Core or State Standards. So for a first grader, reading proficiently means to be able to read a text like this with quite simple sentences, quite similar to oral language. By fifth grade, students need to read more complicated texts that have more complex sentence structure and organization. By 12th grade, by high school, um, the text that students must be able to read and, and uh, understand and make sense of end up looking quite different than oral language. They're quite different than the sort of basic narrative text that students encounter in early grades. So our English learners are faced with not just the challenges of working their second language, but also the challenges of a moving target, that they're trying to, to reach proficiency. And to be proficient readers, they must um, gain higher and higher levels with uh, increased grade levels. So with that, I'll turn to the recommendations. And as I said, this is just going to be sort of a quick overview of the recommendations. Um, think you can think about it as a little bit of a teaser, maybe, that if I spark, spark your interest or say something that sounds like it's something you'd particularly like to learn about, I'd encourage you to go into the guide and read more about that recommendation, but also take a look at the um, nice examples of how that recommendation can be put into practice. The first recommendation, which you'll hear a bit more about um, after I'm finished, will is focuses on academic vocabulary. And this recommendation talks about an approach to academic vocabulary that's more than just teaching words and definitions, but that's teaching students rich concepts and selecting a small number of words to teach in an intensive way across several days using a variety of activities. So in terms of the elements involved in putting this recommendation into place, um, and I'll just do this quite briefly, but uh, teachers, educators should think about choosing an engaging, uh, brief, but challenging piece of text that includes academic vocabulary. Um, so one way to think about this is that we want text that students would like to read and are engaged in reading, and that those are organized around ideas that are worth talking about. So to encourage students to use words in rich ways, we need to give them ideas that are worth talking about. So 
debates, challenges, um, new uh, controversies that students would be engaged with. In terms of selecting words, um, the research should, supports the notion of choosing a small set of words but teaching them in an in-depth way. In terms of the activities, and you'll hear a bit more about some nice examples of this from Joe and Joan in a few minutes, but we need to teach academic vocabulary in depth using multiple modalities, so different types of activities that involve writing, speaking, listening, debating, and so on. We also know from quite a bit of research that because the number of words that students need to learn is much, much more than we could possibly teach directly, we need to teach students word learning strategies that can help equip them so that they can figure out the meanings of words independently when they're reading and listening. The second recommendation focuses on writing instruction. And the idea here is that, um, or excuse me, the second recommendation focuses on oral and writing instruction and integrating it into content area teaching. The basic idea here is that the old sort of traditional model of an ESL teacher um, or ESL instruction that's separate from the rich content that students are learning in other classes is not very successful, but that rather the more opportunities we can have to help students develop language for the real, authentic, and sophisticated purposes of content area learning, uh, the better off they will be. Um, and I think for our teachers in the upper elementary grades, I think this can start certainly very early in kindergarten or first grade, but that as students move up into the upper elementary and middle school grades, this is a bit more challenging, but also a bit more essential because you know, in my time as a middle school teacher, my students spend some time with me in their English class, in their um, focused instruction around English development, but they also spend much of the day in social studies and science and math classes. And in those settings, they also need rich opportunities to develop language, not just general language, but also the specific language of those content areas. We know many students acquire very basic conversational English skills quite quickly or quite easily, but that understanding the rich disciplinary language that they need um, to succeed and to read and write complex texts in social studies or science is a, is a new challenge, a new set of challenges um, that students may struggle with. In terms of putting this implication or putting this principle into place, um, we know that teachers can use um, a variety of instructional tools to anchor their instruction. And by this I mean that you can use tools such as a short video clip to anchor content area instruction and to build a common experience among students. So you can imagine a unit in which a teacher uses a very brief video clip at the beginning, provides um, an opportunity for students to discuss and have a rich conversation about that video clip, and that that conversation serves the basis for returning to those key ideas throughout the instruction. We also know that vocabulary instruction is important not just in an English language arts class, but also in content area instruction, and that students need to learn both content-specific vocabulary, but also the general vocabulary that supports it, the general academic vocabulary that supports those words. <clears throat> we know that students need daily opportunities to talk about rich content, about content that's worth talking about in pairs and in small groups. I think, um, as many of you know, effective classrooms for English language learners are not quiet places. They're places where students are talking a lot, very actively. It doesn't mean that they're out of control. It means that they're often very structured, that these opportunities are structured in certain ways, that students are held accountable for talking about the particular content. They're held accountable for talking about it in increasingly complicated ways and rich ways, but that ultimately there's a lot of opportunities for students to work with content through um, English and through language skills. And then writing instruction is also quite important uh, in content area instruction to give students opportunities to extend their learning um, and their understanding of content material. The third recommendation focuses on written language skills and how to provide structured and regular opportunities for students to develop these skills. I should say that um, for each of these recommendations in the practice guide, we provided a level of evidence rating. And what that means is that means that was based on the number of studies that were available that met the very rigorous standards put forth by the What Works Clearinghouse that supported the recommendation. And so for the first two recommendations I just mentioned, about academic vocabulary instruction and integrating language into content area instruction, the level of evidence was strong for those, 
was for this recommendation, the level of evidence was minimal, which means that there wasn't a large number of studies that had appropriate research designs, that is, experimental, quasi-experimental research designs that supported this recommendation. Nonetheless, I think as a panel, the eight of us um, decided that this was a key recommendation, a key principle that teachers and educators needed to think about and to put into place. In terms of the specific steps or um, elements that instructors can think about, educators can think about, first is to think about writing assignments that are anchored in content. So again, as with the second recommendation, the notion of writing in isolation or writing in, on worksheets or sentences or paragraphs that are disconnected from content can, is not as nearly as effective as anchoring the, your writing instruction in sophisticated ideas and concepts. It's also important to provide language-based supports to help students in their writing assignments. So these can be all sorts of things from sentence starters to organizational frames to analyzing models of writing, all of which are ultimately um, designed to help students understand the language demands involved in writing and to meet those demands. Again, as with the earlier recommendations, we need students to have opportunities to work and talk together on different aspects of writing. So this may involve helping students learn to revise each other's writing, to read each other's writing, helping students to talk together when they're brainstorming ideas for writing, helping students work together to um, improve the increase the sophistication of their writing in a variety of ways. And then, of course, it's also important to give students regular feedback um, and constructive feedback on their writing, as well as assessing writing in a thoughtful way to identify students' instructional needs. Um, this can take a lot of time, of course, and preparation for educators, but I think it's really essential so that we understand how our instruction is, is helping students make progress in their writing. The last recommendation involves providing small group instruction and interventions for students who are struggling in areas of literacy and English language development. And the level of evidence for this recommendation was moderate. So it had a few more studies than our third recommendation, but a few less than our first two, the first two recommendations. The idea here is that we need to think about English learners who may be struggling, particularly with more basic skills in reading, and provide them with some additional intervention that adds value. So when we think about how to put this in place, the first question is how to identify the students who are struggling. And not just struggling um, perhaps because they are new to English or that they're new to particular challenges in schools, but that they show and demonstrate persistent struggles. So by this, we're thinking about students who have had good opportunities to learn, um, that the first three recommendations have been put into place in some ways, but that they're still showing persistent struggles with some aspects of language or literacy development. For these students, we're providing them with intervention, but differentiating it. Um, and in particular, keeping in mind those two problem spaces I mentioned earlier, um, we need to think about how the intervention for students who struggle with code-based skills, who are still struggling to sound out words accurately and fluently, that's going to look quite somewhat different than students who are struggling with meaning-based skills. And as I said a bit earlier, we would anticipate that some English learners will struggle with code-based skills, but that it won't be any, it won't be any more proportionate, it w they won't disproportionately struggle with this. It won't be a huge number of students who are struggling with those basic skills, um, whereas there may be many more students who are struggling with meaning-based skills. It's also important, even when providing targeted intervention for students with code-based skills, they also need attention to meaning-based skills. So that means that while students may benefit um, in second or third grade or even older for some targeted short-term instruction in phonics and basic word reading skills, those students will likely also need some much instruction on meaning-based skills, in part to make sense of the instruction you're doing in phonics or in word-based skills, code-based skills, but also because we don't want them to lose the opportunities to develop rich vocabulary, rich language skills, and comprehension strategies. And then a final thing to keep in mind when thinking about this intervention is that students need to be grouped in thoughtful and purposeful ways. And so we know from research that short-term homogenous groups um, w in which students are grouped together based on their particular needs can be useful for code-based skills. But heterogeneous groups are often more useful when supporting meaning-based skills. So in general, we need to think about grouping that is flexible, by which students are not in some permanent group for a long period of time, but also uh, grouping that supports certain kinds of instruction.
Um, just as a sort of fi to finish up my overview here, um, I'd like to point out that I think in many ways the, the recommendations overlap with one another. And so as you think about how to implement some of these ideas, I think you should think about what you're already doing and the ways in which these recommendations overlap with one another. In particular, I think that across all of these recommendations, there's a real focus on academic content and language, that language is not taught abstracted from the ideas and the purposes for using language, um, and that many of those purposes need to be understanding and working with really complicated and interesting academic content. That as we think about providing this instruction, that we're integrating opportunities for reading, writing, and discussions, rich um, conversations, but that we're also supporting that with various types of scaffolding and support. They were providing some explicit instruction in word meanings and word learning strategies in strategies for writing and so on. And that we're providing this with varied groupings that are appropriate to our students' needs um, and that ultimately can help them reach much higher levels of English proficiency and of academic content knowledge um, than they might be able to otherwise. So with that, I will um, turn it overall open up for questions. Okay, so I see here Linda has put up a good, que a great question for me. Um, so I'll just read this if folks don't, yeah, I'm uh, not sure if folks can see this, but I can, do you want to read it, Linda, or do you want me to? Yes, Michael, and thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. And I think you kind of addressed this already, but there's been a question posed that how do you prioritize which of the four practices should be emphasized first, or do you roll them out all the practices simultaneously? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and we had some discussions at a couple of other bridge events recently about this issue. My thinking about this would be that at a particular school site, a team of teachers and maybe a team of teachers and administrators and support staff should come together and think about what they're already doing well and what they could prioritize next. I don't think that rolling out all four recommendations all at once is necessarily going to work that well, at least in, in, although it depends, of course, on the school setting, right? So I don't think any of these recommendations um, necessarily, um, I think there's a lot of overlap between them and a lot of things that you can do simultaneously. At the same time, I think that schools need to think about their priorities and need to think about how they can emphasize those pieces of the recommendations that they're not already doing and those pieces that they can, they can prioritize for a given year or a given semester. So the goal might ultimately be that a school, um, that the teachers in a school are really using all four practices, but it may be that in a given semester, teachers decide, well, you know, we're really going to focus on academic vocabulary for a little while. Um, we're going to get really good at that because that's something we haven't been doing before or we haven't been doing in the rich way we'd like to. Um, and then maybe the next semester they think about, okay, so now let's bring in the content area teachers and let's build on that success and work with the content area teachers further. I also think the recommendations might have a slightly different responsibilities for different folks. Um, we want uh, responsibility for thinking about English, uh, English learners to be distributed across the school. So it's not just the ESL teacher's job or not just the bilingual teacher's job, but that all teachers in a school are working on this. And so it might be that the English teachers or the ESL teachers or bilingual teachers are thinking about the academic vocabulary piece in a general way whereas the content area teachers are really focusing on recommendation two and thinking about how to improve their content area instruction, for instance. Um, in elementary schools, you might imagine different grade levels taking on different priorities based, on, again, on what they're already doing well and on what they need to improve on. Excellent answer. Thank you, Michael. There's another question. Uh, does PA, phonemic awareness, and phonics fall under skills and codes? Yeah, that's right. So phonological awareness and uh, phonics do, do fall under that, that code-based skills um, problem space I was talking about. That's absolutely right. And I think we have some evidence, and the practice guide talks a little bit about this, um, particularly in relation, I, I believe, to re recommendation four. I think there's some evidence that those code-based skills, um, as I said, English learners generally seem to, many of them seem to master those very quickly and with the same kinds of instruction that native English speakers do, or at least with the same intensity of instruction, but that there may be a small number of English learners, just like there's a relatively small number of monolinguals, who struggle with phonics skills and need some additional intervention. Okay, excellent. And I think we have time for one more question, and I'm posing it in the pod. How do you advance vocabulary instruction with non-readers? Is the focus more on oral academic vocabulary? 
So I, I'm assuming that this, this means sort of pre-readers, so kind of emerging readers in kindergarten and first grade. Um, you know, I think that's right. I think that we should think about, um, in the earliest grades, we should think about vocabulary instruction that is anchored in text in a certain way, but that may not necessarily mean that students are, all, are doing all the reading themselves. So there's good work in kindergarten, for instance, around rich academic vocabulary instruction through book reading and through um, read-alouds. And I think that can certainly be very helpful. Um, I think that um, even for kindergartners and first graders, exposing them to how a word is spelled is helpful. So we don't want to do it entirely free of any um, connection to print. But I do think it's valuable that for kindergartners and first grade, second grade teachers to think about including opportunities to work with academic vocabulary orally. Um, I also think that the words that you would choose for vocabulary instruction in a first grade classroom might be somewhat different than the words you choose for, say, phonics and reading instruction. Um, part of that is because we want our students to be working with somewhat more sophisticated word meanings than they necessarily can always decode at a given level. So kindergartners and first graders who are still learning to break the code, we want to make sure that they're not just learning words like cat and cap, that, they are, that they're learning how to read and how to decode. We also want them learning words like analyze and um, you know, exploration so that they can start learning words that they may not be able to read quite yet, but that, that start in their oral vocabulary. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Now, would the um, answer be the same if they were older non-readers? Um, I, I think so. I think for older students, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rare that you have students who are sort of completely not, you know, I'm not sure I love the word non-readers. <laughs> I'll say that. I think that there are um, students who may have very limited reading skills um, in older grades. I think that, you know, um, and I think for those students who are still in kind of very early levels of, of learning how to read, that uh, oral vocabulary instruction is, is really valuable, absolutely. Um, I think that at the same time, if you have older students who are struggling to read, you want to balance that time that you're spending on oral academic vocabulary uh, instruction with the kinds of interventions to teach them to read. Um, because we do know that uh, we, we, we want to make sure that students have time for both, of course, right? And that for older students, even if they are, haven't had a lot of educational background or they haven't had a lot of experiences where they've been able to learn to read, that there, there, is, there is evidence that they certainly can learn to read and that they, um, older learners can actually do it quicker in some ways, in some settings at least, um, because they have more sophisticated sort of um, cognitive skills in general that they can use to uh, figure out the code. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I think that uh, you've offered a lot of great information. We are, uh, we've concluded Michael's presentation. However, Michael will be avail well, available for additional questions at the end of this webinar. Um, and so thank you, Michael.